All right, everybody, welcome to another edition of Mindset Manifestation Mastery. Today, we are so honored I have my great friend Adam Bauer with us. Adam, I made a great connection with him on Clubhouse, and just a little bit about him. He travels the globe and also Zoom, sharing the heart-expanding beauty of sacred chant, healing touch, the I Ching, and transformational conversation. Adam found the spiritual path as a teenager and was later blessed to spend years playing bass, both with sacred chant pioneer Krishna Das and bhakti yoga legend Shyamdas, nourishing his love of sacred sound and the yoga of devotion. He has long shared his love for the I Ching or books on changes through in-person workshops and private sessions and is now offering introductory courses online as well. His critically acclaimed albums, Shiam Leela and Wonderville, were released on Mantralogy Records, and his latest album, Return to the Sacred, was released this last October. Adam sings and offers workshops and programs on healing sessions worldwide and online. And Adam, welcome to the show, my brother. So excited to have you with us. Thanks so much. I'm happy to be here with you. It sounds Absolutely. so good when you say it like that. So. <laughs> So, so happy to have you with us, man. Um, Just an amazing story. Like we met on Clubhouse and you literally just set my room on fire. So I was like, I have to get him on my podcast. So I wanted to just start off with asking you, like, because you do so much kind of healing, right? Um, How did you kind of first get into conscious and healing work? Basically, I was super lucky Um, while I was in high school growing up in the Boston area. Um, I was having kind of a rough go of it, you know, ninth and 10th grade were pretty, pretty rocky for me. And somewhere uh, around the end of 10th, early 11th grade, I ran to my first kind of devotional spiritual community, which was a bunch of people doing therapeutic massage and plant medicine and I Ching work, the old Chinese book of changes, and just a whole lot of conscious exploratory awareness building and kind of, you know, community, like relationship building stuff. And so I fell in with this crowd of folks and I started hanging out there a bunch and it kind of turned my life around and gave me something positive to to live for and to organize my experience of life around. And so after a couple of years heavy with these folks, I was blessed to be invited to move in to the sort of little apartment was like ground zero of this community. And so I lived there for about three years uh, with my teacher of massage on sacred living. And we we kind of, it was sort of like we ran like a free street clinic basically. There was no, uh, it was no transactional money exchange around massage and healing. It was just a place where people came. Everybody was sort of learning how to do it. And we were trading work with each other and just deep, deep in this transformational cauldron. And so that was what kind of, set my life in this direction amazing that's so amazing to hear and you know with the music like how did we transition from playing just like regular music into playing this like devotional music right and i noticed in your bio there was something about kirtan so explain what kirtan's about and like why do you resonate so deeply with that path sure great question so i first got into music when i was about 21 and i had i got sort of forced into buying a beater old Beatles copy bass from a friend of mine from high school days out in Berkeley, California, while I was hitchhiking around uh, the West Coast over the summer. I'm like, dude, I don't even play the bass. Why am I buying this thing from you? But it ended up at my house and a, and a new friend came over in Western Mass when I first moved out here in the mid 80s. And, uh, and this guy was really into playing reggae and he saw the bass leaning up against my wall. And he's like, dude, I'm coming out next week with my keyboard, my old friend, Anthony Beckwith. And, and I'm like, no, no, I don't play that thing. I bought it for 25 bucks from Josh Kaplan. I don't know how to play that thing. And he's like, no, no, man, I'm into reggae. The bass lines are simple. I can totally teach them to you. And that became like a 15 year run of playing in a reggae rock and roll band with a bunch of my friends, the Equalites based in Western Mass. And we played- That's so cool. We played regionally all around the Northeast. And it was a whole, it was a whole lifestyle and a beautiful one. And so I was into playing bass, playing music in community. And, you know, reggae is basically a devotional music form. I mean, it may not look like it to everybody, but that's really what it is. It's praise music. And so that's where I was at. And I had just gotten turned on in the late 90s to this this kirtan thing. And kirtan is the call and response devotional chanting of sacred mantra, basically the names of God from the 
Indian Sanskrit yoga tradition. And one of the foremost Western kind of proponents and practitioners of this is a guy named Krishnadas. And Krishnadas is pretty well known in, in wider circles these days. But back then, you know, it was a little bit of a fringe thing still. And uh, I heard about it through, you know, friends and friends. And, and I went to a couple of his programs and I really, really dug them. And one of them, I had a gig with my reggae band in Northampton, like that same night. So I saw him the first time I ever really met him. Um, and he was walking in and I was in the hallway waiting to, you know, get let in. I had my bass over my shoulder and I introduced myself, said, you know, we got a few friends in common. They told me to say hi. Da, da, da. And I said, by the way, I'm so sorry. I'm going to be the guy who gets up and walks out in the middle of your thing because I got a nine o'clock load in to my band's playing across town. So, you know, with all due respect, I'm going to like try to creep out quietly. So that planted that seed. And when I connected with him actually at a yoga program that my friends were running in Maui some months later, he's like, you play bass, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, my bass player the last few years is going off on her own way. I got some stuff coming up in the Berkshires and, you know, New York area. You want to hook up and play some bass with me? And I was like, totally, dude. And so, yeah, he'd never heard me play, but he kind of felt the vibe, I guess. And so uh, that May, which was in 2001, uh, we rehearsed for about 40 minutes at his place one time. And then he threw me on stage in front of 600 people at a yoga journal conference on like Friday and Saturday and Sunday nights. And that was the beginning of about a seven year run playing bass with him at pretty much most of his Northeastern regional uh, live programs. And then through that, I met my friend, someone who became a good friend, Shamdas. Shamdas and Krishnadas both kind of followed Ramdas over to India to meet this guy, Neem Karoli Baba. And if you ever read Be Here Now, you know, it's kind of a seminal counterculture opening book from, the, from like 1970, 71. And, um, and so Shamdas was also a, a profound practitioner, American kid, you know, Jewish guy from, from Connecticut, like, like Krishnadas was a Jewish guy from Long Island. But they went over to India and they got bobbed up by North Indian devotional bhakti yoga, which is the yoga of devotion, the yoga of sacred relationship. It's not about standing on your head for hours or meditating with a totally clear mind. It's those are part of it in a way, but it's more about the yoga of being and feeling connected with all of life. And you don't have to be skillful. You don't have to be talented. You just have to be open to it and be open to the yoga of grace. And so through Krishnadas and Shamdas, I went deep into playing bass for these Kirtan live call and response chanting programs. And then at some point I sort of and I, I have to say, I had no ambitions beyond that. I loved it so much. I was really happy doing that. But at some point I started playing around with the harmonium, which is a sort of a hand pump squeeze box, like organ, like a, a hand pump reed organ, which is a European instrument, but it got Indiafied, And it's one of the most common accompaniment instruments for people who are chanting, who are leading chanting. Easier than playing bass, although some people get away with that. Um, and so at some point about 10 years ago or so, I started playing around a little bit with harmonium. And then after my friend Shamdas left his body unexpectedly, it's like I got some kind of inspiration and, and I sort of transitioned from playing bass with loads of people as they were coming through town and at the festivals and whatnot to just playing with my harmonium and singing with myself. And that's how somehow I got into it. It was never about my own like desire to like want to do it. It was just grace picking me out and giving me opportunities and me saying yes to them. That's awesome. So awesome. Just to hear like the different walks of life with music, you know, like playing regular bass and then like playing that, like you said, that accordion kind of thing with the chanting. That's so, so cool. So music for me had a really great impact on my life because I was a break dancer when I was young and Ooh. I just like, I would kind of go into a trance when I would hear the music, you know, I just feel like the stresses of the world would release and any negative emotions I had would just release at that moment. So I wanted to ask you, like, what are your, what's your take on how music can actually heal others? Well, I think as you're talking about, and as many of us have felt in our lives in one way or another, there's something about music. What's the old saying? Music can sort of soothe the savage beast, you know, or the savage breast. 
that we each can have sort of, we get locked up living in America, living in the world. There's a lot of invitations to tighten up and feel afraid or feel uncertain about where we land in the world. And there's something about vibrating strings or a well-sung melody or a beautiful song that can just reach in and unlock something and allow our feelings to move, allow our emotions to flow. And that can help us tap into like what feels true deep inside of us. And so I think, I don't know quite what it is. It's different than painting. It's different than architecture. It's different than all the other beautiful arts that are out there in the world. There's something about music that can just reach in deep and allow us to touch ourselves and feel ourselves in a unique way. And when we do that in a kind of a safe container and inspiring community or with a great band or singer or whatever it is, like there's something about that that can just, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. You felt that it can just touch us in a holy place, in a place that reminds us like, oh, I'm part of all this. Like I'm not separate. Whatever the invitations of of the mainstream culture to keep us, you know, on the rat in the rat race, like those things fall away at a certain point to some degree when we just remember like, wait, we're part of this living, magical, incredible, alive universe. Everything around us is vibrating and pulsing. And if we can accept, if we can sort of see the invitation to connect in a sacred way, then suddenly it's a whole different game. We're still living in the world. We're still shopping. We're still dealing with all Babylon stuff, but in some way we're living in a sacred world instead. And somehow music has this mysterious capacity to open that up and invite us into that awareness. You know, and it's just amazing because as you were describing it, your eyes closed and I could, you know, you could see that you're speaking to it from your heart. And that just goes to show the amazing effect that music and vibrations have on the world. Um, give us some positive affirmations that you use or just things that you use to uplift yourself when you may be feeling down or, you know, just going through like a tough time. Well, I am a firm believer, it's not from an intellectual place, but I've just felt it in my life so much. I try to organize as much as possible around a feeling of gratitude about remembering and being aware of the vast quality and quantity of blessings that I am the recipient of. I mean, it's not just because I'm a white guy living in America, sort of, you know, the apex predator of a of an imbalanced culture, which somehow makes me the recipient of stuff I don't really deserve. Although that's some of it, you got to be honest in this day and age, you know, I've been blessed in that way also in ways that I don't really deserve, but it's more than that. It's a way that each one of us is alive. We have been gifted the presence of spirit, the reality of a body, which means we have the opportunity to engage with each other. We have the opportunity to learn. We have the opportunity to support and encourage and contribute to the lives and the well-being of other people and, and the plants and animals also and the planet as a whole. It's not just about a human thing. So I, I kind of organize myself, you know, many, 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 many times a day just to remember like, man, I am just so fortunate. I'm so blessed. Let me do something with this that honors these blessings. And, you know, there's a lot of mantras that, uh, that, you know, one can sort of take to remind oneself and, and be in relationship with that divine nature. Um, and I come from a practice that involves Sanskrit mantra and everything, but there's one mantra that's actually, you know, also a beautiful one that everybody who speaks English can kind of get with, I think on a deeper level, which is something that came through Ram Dass in his last, um, you know, decades of life, which is just the simple, affirmation or mantra which is i am loving awareness i am loving awareness i i am i am loving i am loving awareness and that kind of says it all in a way and like you know we can all have our bad days i do i'm not always i don't always have my head right and i get caught down different rabbit holes of kind of you know unaligned attitudes and different moods and you know life is challenging for all of us but to just be able to remember like oh you know what underneath all of it i am loving awareness i am a soul incarnated with 
boundless blessings and I'm super grateful for that. And I wanna, I wanna live my life as an offering to the, the life, the spirit, God, who brought me here for some mysterious reason and let my life be a gift to those around me so that I can take the benefits and, and blessings and, and gifts that I have been given as a human being and offer those to support and be of some service to those around me. And that usually keeps me in kind of the right mood, you know? Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's like you said, practice kind of the attitude of gratitude, right? And when you just look at life from a place of wanting to live to serve and help others, um, no matter what things happen, we can always just kind of refocus and move forward in the right light, you know, because the thing is, we can't always control what happens to us, but we can always control how we react to these things. And we have to just be a little mindful of kind of the words that we speak, you know, so practicing positive affirmations, little things like I am love in, in, in service of love. I am here to help others. I deserve to be loved. That makes a huge difference in life. Right. So glad, glad that, uh, totally resonated with that, my brother. So tell me a little bit more about the, um, the Ish, it's Ishing, right? I Ching, I Ching, I Ching. Yeah. right. So tell me about the I Ching. Like, what has that practice meant for you in your life? And how do you actually use it to help others? Sure. Well, the I Ching is one of the oldest books in the world. It means the, the book of changes or the classic of changes. And it predates Lao Tzu and Confucius from that lineage of ancient Chinese sages. And and so it was kind of the attempt of the early Chinese mind, we're talking probably three, four, 5,000 years ago, um, to understand the processes of change and transformation in the world, in the universe, in the life around us and within ourselves. And so this book of changes was developed as a way to sort of mirror and reflect the cosmic processes of change. And, you know, we're all familiar uh, with the 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 image of the yin yang, you know, the sort of the light and the dark in this constant dance of apparent duality. You know, it's it's a oneness that is comprised of the dance of the positive and the negative, the light and the dark, the within and the without. And so these cosmic kind of polarities dance in three dimensional, four dimensional creation in a way that allows for this endless exploration of life and beauty and darkness and love and hope and sadness and heartache and all of it. And so the I Ching somehow crystallizes a fantastic amount of cosmic teachings and perspective and alignment practices in, in a book. It's basically comprised of 64 chapters, each of which kind of is expressive of a kind of um, a, a sort of life situation, a kind of uh, emblematic life situation. And, and there's a way that you come, come to it um, through a couple different methods where you can ask a question of it. You can, bring, you can bring your frustrations, your misunderstandings. I don't know how to make the next step here. Like, please help me out. Like, help a brother out. I'm confused, you know? So you don't necessarily just read it like straight through, but we come to it uh, I mean, I did it for many years as a daily practice. I would I would throw my coins in the morning. I would generate a reading. I would read it. And then I'd go to high school and I'd live my day. And then I'd come back and check it out later. My father gave me my first copy of the I Ching when I was like 15 or 16 years old. So it hit right around the same time as I met that first healing community. And it turned out that almost everybody in this healing community was also really into the I Ching. And they were all working the same translation, which is this Wilhelm Bain's translation. Wilhelm was a guy who lived in China for decades and studied with a, a Chinese Taoist master there. And through his immersion in the culture and in those teachings was able to, to bring a faithful translation into German, which was then through a connection with Carl Jung, uh, the famous Swiss psychiatrist, was translated by one of his students into English in around 49, 1950. And so this practice of immersing in this mysterious but amazingly effective practice opens up territory I'd never even knew really existed. 
So when I'm sort of at the end of my own capacity to think my way through a situation, or when my intuition isn't really giving it up and I'm actually just not sure what to do, the I Ching is a practice that I can lean on. And once in a while, it's not quite sure, clear exactly what it's saying, but most of the time it's astonishingly clear and cogent and inspiring and kind of revealing of what my next steps are. We don't really need to know what the 50th step is. What we really mostly need to know in any given moment is like, what's my next step? And am I going in the right direction? And so this book of changes practice has revolutionized my life since I was 16 years old. And, and because it's literally from a different culture and another time, it can really take several years of regular study before the fog starts to clear and you begin to as a Westerner, at least as an American, before it became kind of a little bit more clear, like what on earth is going on here? So one thing I love to do in my work is, is offer myself as a translator for people who want access to that, but who don't right now have three to five years to put into it to really start un unpeeling it all. So, so I sit with people, I help them sort of settle into like, what's your moment? What's your question? What's your challenge? Like, why are you here? What, what would be helpful for you to know? What kind of upgrade of your awareness would be useful right now? And, you know, that kind of conversational back and forth to settle on the moment, the situation, the question um, is often, you know, half of the fun and half of the challenge, you know? So that takes two minutes or that takes 40 minutes, whatever it takes. And then at some point, you know, I just have them throw the coins and then I read and kind of translate and contextualize because I've read it all, uh, you know, a thousand times before. And so I see connections in it that you wouldn't as a first time or even a 10th time practitioner. So I kind of act as a bridge to help bring the teachings into some kind of digestible perspective. And sometimes that's really needed. And other times the reading itself just pins people and they're like, whoa, what is this thing? Like, how does this, how does this do this? And I gotta say, dude, I don't know how it works. But I just know, I know that it works because I've seen it for 40 years now. I've been working with this thing and it blows my mind on the regular. And so it's been part of what I've brought to organizations and to individuals and to couples and to, you know, whoever's open to it. Teams, people who are, because like we need something that's bigger than each one of our egos, basically. We got five people in a right. band on a team and we're trying to figure out like which direction to go. If it's just all of us, you know, kind of trying to enforce our own perspective, sometimes that works okay and sometimes it doesn't work okay. But sometimes when we like go to an impartial observer, you know, sort of a teacher or a, a, a source of wisdom that's bigger than all of our egos, it can allow us to reflect in a different way. And then, the, and then the path ahead sometimes can become more clear. So I realized during the COVID times, I mean, I've, I've been teaching workshops occasionally on working with the I Ching for at least 20 years, in, you know, in-person festivals and, you know, workshops and stuff, but I never really done online teaching. And so this year I decided to take the COVID break while I've been here on the farm for the last year. And, uh, and I put together my first online course basically introducing people to how to work this. And so we had about a dozen people in the fall for the inaugural run of it. And it was really, really sweet. People really got it and it was a lot of fun and I really enjoyed it. So I'm gonna be starting another one in I think the middle of March. Um, it's like awesome. a seven week, seven week course. It doesn't take, you know, it's like an hour and a half or two each week. And, and, and at the end of that seven weeks, you really walk away knowing the basics, knowing how to throw the coins and generate your own reading and not being just completely gobsmacked by this is too confusing and too weird and I don't really know what this is saying. So that's been a fun thing for me these last months is, is bringing this I Ching practice into a, a wider offering so that people can access it. I love the work that you're doing. I mean, that's just amazing that, you know, you're bringing this powerful stuff out to the masses and you're making it accessible online. Like now I'm interested. Now you piqued my interest and I definitely oh, want to get involved. Yeah. I would man. love to have you involved in the next course, man. I'll send you the info after. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to ask for a big ask. Um, we talked about music a lot. We talked about chanting and healing. Would you be so kind to share with the audience some of your magic? Oh, I'd love to, man. I'd love to. Awesome. Uh, awesome. Awesome. My brother. Um, you know, a lot of what I do, most of what I do is 
I mean, it's not quite traditional kirtan because I'm a gringo from, you know, the, the US of A, but, but it mostly is around Sanskrit chanting and stuff. I think maybe I will sing one that I, I wrote um, recently that's on my newest album, which is a combination of English and Sanskrit, because I've been exploring a little bit, you know, like trying to sing in my own mother tongue, you know, like there's something about mantra that opens up space that's really unusual and beautiful and sacred. But there's something about the language that we grew up speaking that kind of gets into us in another way too. So this song is sort of an attempt to put it all together in a sacred way. peaceful in my body. I am healing, I am healing, I am healed. I am safe and peaceful in my body. The outside world hard Perfect place I'm meant to be. The outside world, heartbreaking as it feels, is the perfect place I'm meant to be. Hariyam Tat Sat Satchimanda. Hariyam Tat. Sachinanda Ariyam Tat Sat Sachinanda I am happy, I am seen, and I am. Where I go, I feel at home. I am happy, I am seen, and I am known. Everywhere I go, I feel at home. I am blissful, I am conscious, I am true. Love is the essence of my. I am blissful, I am conscious, I am true. Love is the essence of my nature. Adiyam Tat Sat Sachinanda. Adiyam Tat Sat Sachinanda. Ariyam Tat Sat Guidance and pro is my daily bread. Seva is the path I walk alone. Guidance and protection is my daily bread. Seva is the path I walk alone. Every day I to the cosmos. Every day I'm blessed to be alive, bowing humbly to the cosmos. 
That was that just the same thing. thing. We, have, we the have the audio, audio reverb. reverb. It's, it's oh yeah. It sounds I need the original sounds on when I'm playing and singing, but it needs to be off while we're talking. Wow. I just have to say, Adam, that was like I, I can't even describe how I feel right now. Just amazing. I, I feel so at peace and filled with such serenity like a beautiful beautiful and the way you go back and forth between your native tongue and it's just wow that is so amazing thank you man and you know it's what we were talking about before right the the, the inspiring and transformational power of even a simple song it doesn't have to be all it doesn't have right. to be, like you don't have to be chick Corea. you just have to sing with heart right and, and it opens up sort of the doors of the universe in some way. And, you know, one more thought on this is that this practice of Kirtan, I mean, we're all doing the best we can with Zoom, you know, and, yeah. and it's a blessing to have these ways to be connected in these strange times. But actually the roots of this practice, it's a congregate, it's, you know, it's call and response. So it's a congregational singing thing. Um, there's always a leader leading the chant but that's the, it's not like a performance. It's not really entertainment. If you hang around long enough, it's usually like the microphone passes and a lot of different people will take that lead position. And, and so usually we gather in a circle or we gather in a group and, and we sing these songs together. We chant these songs together. And, and that power of sharing breath and sharing sound and, and being in that vibrational space together there's something really potent and beautiful and healing about this practice when we when we do it the way it's intended, which is together, hanging out, you know, not not as a show or performance or a gig, but as you know, devotional practice, as worship, as 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 connecting with each other, as the sacred beings we are, and the way that people melt in these things. I mean, my first. I mean, still really, but my first, you know, bunch of programs where I was doing this, man, I would, I would be weeping. People would be weeping. And like, it's literally the thing at the end of the thing, you would give your sister or your brother the shirt off your back at the end of that night, if they need it. And you didn't even need to know their name because that feeling of connectedness, it just became so obvious again, like, right. We have these separate bodies and we don't know each other's names and the society we live in has set up a lot of separation and distance. But the reality is we are all at one in our essence. And the more we remember that, not from an intellectual understanding, but from a, 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 a kind of tactile, like, oh yeah, we really are oneness. We really are love in a body. And that just changes the whole game in terms of how we live in this world and how we relate with each other. 
Amazing, Adam. You you are just such an amazing person, man. And I have so much respect for you. Please let the viewers know um, how they can support you, how they can find you on social media, how we can stay in touch with our friend Adam. Sure. Thank you so much, man. Uh, basically, uh, I'm not the most active on social media, but if you can find me on there, it's probably going to be on I am Adam Bauer. My last name's B A U E R. So my website is I am Adam Bauer.com and Facebook, I am Adam Bauer and, uh, and Instagram, I am Adam Bauer. And, um, I have my several albums are available for purchase and download on my website. You can listen to them on Spotify and all the places where um, artists don't get paid for music. And, um, and I do a bunch of, you know, I mean, my, I grew up in all of this healing world in a very non-transactional way. So I haven't really tried to sort of like turn it all into a career or monetize it all. Like, you know, everybody's got to eat. I respect that. And, you know, me too, but it's really important for me. It always has been that, that this work and this, all these offerings, this reality is available to people who need it, you know? So um, one of the things that people are into this kind of thing, I do a free uh, evening Zoom thing every Monday and Wednesday and Friday, uh, eight o'clock Eastern time, usually runs for about an hour. Uh, and the links, you'll see that if you go to IamAdamBauer.com, you know, there's some things there where you can, uh, you know, get the links to that. And it's just a free thing on Zoom. And we usually sing a little bit and sometimes I'll share some readings or something that's inspiring me that's making me think. Sometimes I'll talk a little bit or share some reflections. Sometimes we'll just sit in silence for a little bit. And usually there's space like if you came and you're like, hey, man, I've been thinking about this thing or like, it makes me, you know, like there's room for all of us to be in conversation. That's why I like Zoom instead of like Facebook where it's just like one way, you know, action. So yeah, I am adambauer.com and all the other things and uh, love to be in touch with people and you know, everybody's always welcome. Awesome, Adam. Well, I just have to, again, express my gratitude for having you on here, uh, sharing your joy, sharing your gifts and sharing your healing with the audience. So thanks again. This was another edition of Mindset Manifestation Mastery. Stay tuned for next week's episode, guys. Thanks again, Adam. Thanks so much, brother. Look forward to crossing paths down the road. Absolutely.